There are those that are in the pulpits of churches and they try to impress men and women. And that becomes a big problem. That's not why they're there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television. We are a program taking you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 every single year. It is exciting. Today in the book of Matthew, Corey is here. Corey, what's up? Today I'm going to be exploring the scribes and the Pharisees. Excellent job. I look forward to that report just around the corner. What did you study today? We're saved by Jesus. All right, very good. Are you saved by Jesus Christ? That's important. Ryan, what's up? Is the Bible just a book of fairy tales and legends? After all, the Bible mentions unicorns. More on this later. Unicorns, really? Well, that's interesting. We'll talk about that. So get the most important book in your life, the Bible. Get it out and get the Bible guide out because it is time to study and pay attention to God's wonderful word. Today, you and I are going to be focusing in on two different people groups from specifically the time period of Jesus. So the first century AD, a people group called the scribes and then the Pharisees. Now, these groups are mentioned several times throughout the New Testament gospels and many times Jesus is challenging them or being challenged by them. So we're gonna find out what that's all about right now. In the New Testament Gospels, it's common to read references to the scribes and Pharisees. These two groups held a prominent place within first century Judaism. It's commonly acknowledged that the term scribe generally refers to people who are tasked with writing down words and histories. Within Judaism, this meant specifically the copying of Hebrew scriptures. The scribes' resulting familiarity with the scriptures led many to become well-respected as experts and teachers in the Law of Moses. In first century AD Judaism, scribes could come from any of the religious denominations, but it's frequently assumed that most came from the sect of the Pharisees. The Pharisees became a recognizable group during the time between the events of the Old and New Testaments. The term may mean separatist, as they were opposed to the king-priest designation claimed by the Hasmonean dynasty. Their rival religious faction in this respect became the Sadducees, who had embraced the king-priest concept. Pharisees were generally not from the nobility or wealthier classes of people. Their top priority was applying the scriptures to the everyday life of the everyday Jew. This took the shape of teachings or rules about the laws of Moses, how to follow the Mosaic law in contemporary life. Their knowledge, paired with their normal stations in life and their concern for the everyday man, made Pharisees very popular influencers with the masses. Alternatively, they were treated with suspicion and fear by some of the much smaller upper class. Pharisees seem to have been anti-Roman in that they wanted political and religious freedom without mixing pagan culture into Judaism, but they were also usually non-violent, preaching instead that as the masses turned to God, he would provide deliverance. Their distinguishing religious beliefs included their insistence on the immortality of the soul, the existence of angels and demons, a combination of free will choice and God's predestination, future rewards and punishments in the afterlife, and a physical bodily resurrection. From growing up in the Christian church, I can tell you from personal experience that it's very easy to demonize the scribes and the Pharisees. And by that, I mean, just look at them as the enemy. Look at them as someone that Jesus opposed simply because they were wrong. They were the bad guys of the New Testament. And often that's kind of how we phrase it in children's church. We, we kind of teach our children that it's easier, these concepts, you know, we see Jesus as the good guy and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, that we're gonna talk about on another show, uh, you know, as the bad guys. And there's this dialogue between the good guy and the bad guys, and we don't want to be the bad guys. And, you know, there is truth in that, but we, as we get older, we have to look at a picture that's a little bit more complex than that. And yes, the ideas espoused by the scribes and the Pharisees, they definitely weren't perfect, which is why Jesus challenged them, and which is why they challenged Jesus. They found some of his teachings to be offensive. But if I'm being perfectly honest, sometimes I find 
find some of God's teachings personally offensive as well. And what happens, that's a perfectly normal and acceptable thing to feel as a Christian. When you feel offended by something that you read about in God's word or something that you believe God has told you, then you take that to God and dialogue with him about it. The problem with most of the scribes and the Pharisees is that they stood hard and fast in the face of Jesus and said, no, you're wrong, I won't change. As Christians, we vow to be changed by Christ. You know, the Lord speaks to us across time. If we listen, we become wise. There is a great group called the Brethren, a denomination of Christians who actually believe that God called us not to be pastors or leaders, but to be brethren. One of the scriptures for that group is Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 to 12. Those who believe this passage say certain people should not delegate themselves to teaching or preaching God. Rather, we should all do that, since we are all brethren. Jesus Christ told the multitudes that the way we think of leadership must change. No longer should we praise people as leaders who speak to God for us. Rather, we should remember that God speaks to all of us through his Holy Spirit, and we can talk to him. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew chapter 23 verses 1 through 12. It's interesting, you know, when we read chapter 23 of this particular passage, we learn that seven woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, again, the scribes and the Pharisees are two groups of people that God really goes head to head with in this time that Jesus Christ is here. Why is that? Well, the Sadducees had a more formal religious education and they had everything that they had to do. And by the way, they did not believe in the resurrection or much in the afterlife. But the Pharisees had a, a form of religion based on oral tradition or spoken tradition, not just the scriptures. Jesus Christ had difficulty with both of those because they didn't really understand God. They didn't really know. They were making more out of the, the things that they said and the things that they learned rather than listening to God's word. I think that's interesting. Get your Bible guide, turn to today's page as we focus on this today and get the Bible. That's the most important book of all. And when you do that, remember this is original material. Now, if you don't have yours, you can use the addresses at the bottom of the screen. We'd be happy to send it to you. So just write to us there. Or you can go to www.biblediscovery.com. 
DiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. When you go there, click on donate, uh, make a donation in any amount. That'll help us tremendously. And uh, by the way, the donations, pray about it. Ask what God would have you do. And if you've made a donation, thank you so much. We really appreciate that through the summer and all of that. Uh, it continues to help us. Thank you so much. As we focus on this, we need to learn what God is saying in the ways of truth. What does that mean? Well, really, I call this the brethren, because this is a great read for us to understand what this means. Now, the look is from Matthew 22 to 23. And the look at specific chapters is Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12. Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that you would help us to see your scripture and to see what you said. Help us not to read into it, but help us to read out of it so it can correct us and help us, Lord, today. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen. When we look at this scripture, it's interesting. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus spoke. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, both. He said, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. Do not do according to the works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. This is Jesus Christ speaking this. Let me tell you something. There are those who attempt to manipulate who God is, manipulate who God is to us. But they can't if we know the Lord of the Bible. There are many people that have pulpits and they teach many things in their pulpits, not the Bible. And that's a problem. I don't say trust in the church. I say trust in the word of God and the word of God will take you to the right church. The church is God's idea. But it's directed by the word of God. The church, the true church of God is defined by the scripture. Very important. So you don't want to take, you know, the pop psychology today and do that. You want to use the scripture because the scripture talks about what God did and how God did it and why. So we need to understand that. Now, that's very important here. Let's go back to the scripture and learn more. Chapter 23, verse 5 says, But all their works, the scribes and the Pharisees, they do to be seen by men. They're show-offs. They want to be important. So they do to be seen by men. They make their uh, phylacteries broad and enlarge their borders of their garments. They love the best places of the feast, the best seats in the synagogue, greeting in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. Verse 8 says, but you do not be called rabbi, disciples, don't. For one, capital O, is your teacher. That's Jesus Christ. And you are to all be brethren. Now that's interesting. What does that mean? People who look to impress men and women. Okay, this is important. People who look to impress men and women do not truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have somebody who is preaching a pulpit and he's trying to impress the people, that's wrong. That is not going to work. If you're called to the ministry, you're called to teach what Jesus Christ said. You're called to teach what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit has spoken. This is what he said. The Bible, the 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years, all with the same theme. The theme is Jesus Christ, by the way. We need to understand that there is a church that follows the scripture. And that church is the one that we go to. That's the church we follow. So we have to understand that when we see somebody and we determine, well, they're, you know, it's clearly they're trying to get something. It's wrong. Beloved, we must understand. We must pray for our pastors and pray for people and begin to understand that. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. It says, do not call anyone on earth your father, anyone on earth your father. For one, capital O, is your father. 
he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one, capital O, is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. He who's greatest should be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Teaching of Jesus Christ right here. You see, Jesus Christ told us not to call anyone father or teacher. Anyone. There's only one great leader, and that is Jesus Christ. Beloved, we must hear what the Lord says. We must hear what the Bible talks about. We must learn what it says and put it in our heart. We don't read the Bible to see, I know I'm right, and I know it's in there, a Bible somewhere. I'm going to read it until I find it. Hold on a minute. If you know you're right, then, you know, you don't really need the Bible, do you? So keep this in mind. You read the Bible so that your heart can be right. The Bible is always right. We need to understand that, beloved. Now, today, that's a big change because everybody's running around doing all kinds of things, promoting themselves. But beloved, as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, in the Bible, in the Word of God, we need to say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Help me to bring myself to the point where I can learn from your scripture. And I can learn from your word. That's important today. Jesus Christ tells a parable. Now, this is fascinating because he explains how people react to the kingdom of God. We do not build doctrines on parables, but it is very interesting. Join us next time on Quick Study. We'll talk about it. Ryan? Well, you know, many critics of the Bible have pointed to certain Old Testament passages in certain translations of the Bible where it mentions a unicorn. This, critics say, is proof that the Bible is just a book of legends and fairy tales. But what did God really say? Let's find out. Many believe that the claimed word of God, the Bible, is just a book of fairy tales and legends and has no real application or authority for our lives. For example, critics point out nine different passages in the Old Testament which seemingly refer to the mythological unicorn. Indeed, the unicorn is mentioned in the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible, as well as some other versions in other languages. However, there is still much disagreement among Bible scholars today over the meaning of the original Hebrew word. In the original language, the word is re'em. In modern Hebrew, this word means wild ox, and many scholars believe that this is the correct translation. One commentator even notes that when observed closely, the original Hebrew of Deuteronomy 33.17 does not actually allow for re'em to be translated as unicorn. Yet some other scholars have also provided compelling evidence that this ancient word is conveying a single-horned creature, and therefore should be translated as unicorn. Still, even if this is the correct translation, there is no need for Bible students to be troubled. Indeed, Dr. Elizabeth Mitchell observes how quick we are to forget that a single-horned feature is not uncommon on God's menu for animal design. Consider the rhinoceros and the narwhal. Furthermore, this creature mentioned in the Bible is clearly not the same as the fanciful one-horned horse-like animal found in ancient Chinese creation mythology, which only gentle maidens can tame. Indeed, the Bible describes an animal that is very strong, that is useless for agricultural work, and unwilling to work for men. An animal that skips like a calf and bleeds when it dies. Additionally, the fact that the unicorn is listed alongside other real animals in the Bible, such as lambs, goats, and donkeys, is evidence that it is referring to a real creature. 
Those who believe that the Bible is truly describing a one-horned animal have offered a couple of suggestions as to the identification of the creature, one of which is the Elasmotherium, which is an extinct giant rhinoceros. Whatever the case, there is no mistake in the Bible. This creature, whatever it was, was very real, just as is the rest of the Bible's account. So we see here that whatever this animal was, was indeed very real and not so strange. The mythical horse-like unicorn, however, is found nowhere in the Bible. Once again, the Bible demonstrates itself to be a book not only with no real errors, but one that is truly divinely inspired. You know, Ryan, the Bible, it's important because the Bible itself is a unique book. And uh, a, a lot of times we talk about the Bible from the English perspective because, you know, we're talking about English here because of the English language. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, the, the, King, the uh, English language has changed a lot mm -hmm. since 1611. Absolutely, um, yeah. That was the translation of the, new, or the uh, King James Version, the only Bible named after a man. King James Version, by the way. Interesting. But um, there were a couple of Bibles before that, but really it's changed a lot, and I like the ESV now. But we need to hear what God says from his word, mm -hmm. the original languages, yeah. which are Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Yeah, absolutely. It's very important. I mean, those are the original languages, and sometimes words uh, don't exist, you know, in the in the English language. Mm -hmm. And so words are, like you were mentioning the other loving day, kindness. loving kindness, mm -hmm. you know, like that, that was a word that was created. So, I mean, it's very important. And I don't agree with people who say, oh, you only need this version or you only need that version uh, because it's, they're all translations. Yeah, they are know? translations and they're good translations. Our English translations are very good as mm -hmm. far as translations go because they're translating thoughts. They really are. It's not yeah. just, you can't just do word for word because some words don't exist and, and language is altered and changed by culture. So mm -hmm. every culture has a different saying. And so if we just translated a saying word for word, well, when you say a saying, you don't mean the meaning of the literal words. You mean an implied meaning, yeah. if you're following what I'm trying to say, if you catch my drift to use a saying. There are two um. kinds of, and there are two kinds of, uh, the, the way the thinking goes on this is the translators. Every Bible version has a number of translators. It does. Dynamic equivalence and formal equivalence. Formal equivalence is word for word translation. Mm -hmm. Dynamic equivalence is thought for thought translation. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a combination of those because you go from the yeah. Hebrew, you know, you go to prophetic, yeah. which the There's Hebrew a lot of different genres poetry. In the Bible. Yes. Uh, I mean, you talk about the Psalms and you talk about the Proverbs and you talk about the prophetic. That's incredible. But I also think it's important for people to know that they don't have to learn biblical Hebrew or biblical mm -hmm. Greek to understand what the Bible is talking about. When we say we should go back to the original languages, is it's helpful when there's a confusing area of scripture or a word that doesn't quite make sense. It's helpful then to yeah. look at the original or language gonna, and see. And I'm speaking to those who are going to make an accusation. If you you're going to make an accusation against scripture, see, yes. then it's very important to check. Look, check actually into the original language. The original language. Right. Very good. What did you do, Corey, or Janice? Well, I very much appreciated how you um, introduced your segment today, Corey, oh, talking about the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, and mm -hmm. how a lot of times they get a bad rap. Yes. And, and, you know, oftentimes I look at how they react and I wonder if I was in that time of history, whether I wouldn't be standing making the same accusations from my own uh, pr proud and arrogant statements yes. and, and built a lot on traditions. And so sometimes I can understand where they're coming from. But the point that you made was that they, like we, need to allow ourselves to be changed by Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. by the word of God. And I think in this chapter that we're looking at, it's Matthew chapter 23, we see that Jesus is, is you know, really scorning the scribes and the Pharisees for their attitude, their attitude of self-righteousness, mm -hmm. their attitude of being just a little bit better than everyone else. And, and trying to appear so much on the outside, they would mm -hmm. wear their phylacteries, which contain scrolls of, of the scripture, and it would be on the, ar on the arm or on the forehead, and, and mm -hmm. tassels that would be attached to, to the other garments, and they would make theirs longer, so that they would appear to be more pious, more religious, mm -hmm. better than everyone else, and carry themselves amongst the people. And this was something that Jesus did not agree with. And, and 
to be a great leader, to be a great teacher, to be the best father, which God is. Mm -hmm. God is the one true God. He is the true teacher. He became a servant. Yes. And that's what he taught. And so that idea that you, that you spoke on, Corey, that we all need to be changed by Christ, it reminded me Romans 3, 9 through 26, the v- verse here, uh, 10, starting at 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all fallen from grace and we've been, we've been extended God's justice and mercy. Mm through faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he said in Matthew, and it's 23, and I love this because it's 23, 23, Mm -hmm. so it makes it really easy to remember. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. He's not saying "Don't, don't not teach those things, but he's saying justice and mercy and faith, these you ought to have done. Mm-hmm. without leaving the others yes. undone. And that's what's so important. Yeah. And I think too, as I, as I heard you talking about the symbols of the phylacteries and things like that, and I know your heart that you're not against the symbols. No, None of us are against right. the symbols. The problem is, because a symbol is something that reminds, reminds you of a absolutely. truth. Absolutely. The problem is when the symbol stops being about reminding yourself about the truth and starts to become about showing everybody else how great you are, that's a crossover. That's a, a switch that has gone the wrong way yes. and you don't want to do it. And that's what Jesus was reacting to too, we see in the Gospels. And, and, and let me clarify that as well further, that it wasn't the wearing of those things or the yes. tassels. That was a part of the, the priestly um, garments yeah. and command. What they did was they made theirs larger yes. and bigger so that it, it was would appear. For show. It was for show. Yeah. And that's what Jesus was teaching against. So thank you very much mm. for bringing that up. I would mm. never want anyone to think differently in that yeah. way. I think it's important to recognize that all of us do it. All of us, hmm. you know, we try to show off and yeah. we are constantly reminded that we we don't need to do that with no. God. We just need to let the Lord uh, take control of our lives and allow him to speak to us and through us. Mm-hmm. Because when we do that, when we put ourselves in the place of saying, Lord, we really need help. We, <laughs> we need your guidance and your direction. But then God takes over. And when God takes over, I mean, I got to tell you, when the Lord takes over, you can't go wrong because God does everything. So I I really believe that we need to consider letting the Lord take control of our lives. 